Back to the moto vlog, back to having a ride with Fabian. Only this time, more of a tourist than a traveler. And more of a boys trip than a couple on a journey, really. So let's go for a ride. Start at the beginning, actually. Sam, my beautiful and beloved wife, awaited me at her family's in Northwest Indiana. To pull off seeing my boy Fabian and making it to the family gathering, I knew it would be tight and not so comfortable, but the restless types out there will understand. Similar to a rocking chair, the restless are never truly themselves unless they are moving. It took me two days and two nights to get from Austin, Texas to Moab, Utah. The only reasonable way to pull the trip off was having an overnight layover in Las Vegas. <laughs> Vegas. Not too long ago, Sam and I came through here. I haven't been back since, but if you come over here, you face northeast towards Interstate 15. And those are the beautiful mountains right back there that Sam and I crossed with her absolutely terrified to arrive here shortly thereafter texas ice apocalypse occurred i slept in the airport then made it to salt lake city for my first time the following day motorcycle rentals in moab are a ripoff so i followed fabian's suggestion and rented a bike from this site a lot like airbnb for motorcycles the only problem is this rolled in the moment i got my hands on it yeah! I decided to eat lunch downtown, then hit the road for a four-hour journey, headed to the southeast. Sounds pretty damn good, man. Pretty damn good. Yeah, so that went off like a lead balloon. and wet I decided to stop halfway. I'm a bit more long in the tooth nowadays and I wasn't about to push it. I stayed in Price, Utah. Fitting name since it has always been the principle determining my cheapskate maneuvering through lands far from home. If I had a twin, I swear we could have fabricated copper wire out of fighting over a penny. Still, I wasn't about to wild camp all wet and cold. Good morning. Buenos dias from Utah. Stayed here, it was quite nice. I'm ready and I got the old Harley. Bunk shakalaka is right out my window. As you can see, the sun's coming up. It's going to be a beautiful day. Once again, for me, this was a destination type of trip, more than a Pan American journey.
I didn't even know for my aforementioned Pan Am trip in 2021, but then again, I am probably the only one who cares. At the end of the day, I'm just some guy, just another homo sapien crawling about creation before returning to dust like the rest of them. Morbid. Beautiful day in God's country, Utah. Check it out. So this is what it looks like to roll into Moab from Salt Lake City. Fabian mentioned a coffee shop to meet at. I could almost see him now, abiding by the dictates of a seemingly lifelong commitment and connecting to free Wi-Fi. He's one of the few people I'm close to who is cheaper than myself. The real McCoy when it comes to being a bum with a bike. Favorite Royal Enfield bum. Of course, he was interested in the bike hey, I'd rented. Bro. Nice to see I you. I, I thought you have a, a Yamaha or something. I'd almost forgotten how many necks turned and questions were posed in regards to his conversation piece of a bike while hanging out with the guy. Just as soon as we were reunited, I immediately remembered this. He probably answered just as many questions in German as he did in English, actually. This is like the fourth group of German speakers that Fabian's met here. The Germans love the West. The Germans are invading. Germans are everywhere. We plan on wild camping for the night, so it was best to stock up on provisions before heading out of town. We'd shop together before in Baja, California, but this time I got to shop with a guy in my own country. The cashier was a beautiful representation of the Second Amendment. Hello, how are we doing today? Doing well. I'll take that shotgun. 12 gauge? <laughs> yeah, 12 gauge. Or the AR. Oh, the AR. Maybe a 20 gauge while we're at it and an AK. 9 mils. There we go. Man, this place has everything. We do. What's that job? Utah's beautiful. Yes. And especially when you know they have a um, open carry too. Didn't know Utah had recently become a constitutional carry state. Well, I went ahead and got my concealed permit, and then they went open constitutional carry. Michael, welcome, cover. America. Fabian suggested Canyonlands first, then Arches National Park. I hate planning, so I was happy to go and see whatever. I'd finally arrived. Fabian and Travis, amazing, super amazing adventure time. We're here, this is the Monitor and Merrimack Butte. 
that uh, was named after the ironclads in the Civil War we just read. Pretty epic. Oh, hell yeah. We got a fly over here. Check them out. Pretty cool. about riding with Bobby on, or what had me feel it was worth it to make the trip all the way up anyway, would be just how the guy simply is. So many people stop and ask about his bike or share some personal anecdote of their own, and he'd always just sit there, quiet and calm, and listen to them, no matter what came out of their mouth. In town when you pass us, a damn, he's running on one cylinder. Oh, okay. <laughs> He always answers their questions just as he had once with me. Always the same, always with total humility, a genuine introvert. Something, nothing short of an asset to the man who'd literally ridden around the world on a diesel-powered 1972 Royal Enfield. Just a temperament of resignation, seemingly. Almost as though he were a POW forced into having to give up some information. He never just offered up his six-year journey, spanning pre and post, you know what, during his Pan American tour. If you wanted to know, you had to ask. Otherwise, to the common observer, he was just some Swiss German guy writing about, fully face shielded with a look of slight amusement on his face. I never know him to go by nicknames and he didn't seem to care how many people pronounced his name wrong. They pronounced it better in Mexico as far as I could tell. He knew nothing of what was on the news. All that seemed to occupy his mind, all the time I knew him was an unending desire to see what was over the horizon, what beauty creation may have to offer, just ahead. Only once did he ever offer advice to me, drawing from his own experience, of course. It was practical and sound advice, meant to help save me from inadvertently creating my own suffering in the future. It was after a few days later at the campsite we met at in Laredo, actually. He was at the end of his five-year journey momentarily. I was still in my first months. He has been riding bikes his entire life. He has done long-term overlanding via motorbike before, with and without a woman for company. He told me only twice he'd run out of diesel on the entire trip, once getting rejected by some gaucho in the middle of nowhere Argentina, even though the guy actually had some. He'd been robbed before, and once it almost cost him his life. He'd give you anything you may need on the road, and show you all the pin drops on his Google map, spots he flagged, all the way from Tierra del Fuego up to the Dalton Highway in North Alaska. When we first met, he wanted to continue north, but he had still to wait for the U.S. border to open. Sam and I rode down seeing his pins, all those he had dropped on iOverlander along the way, oftentimes reminding us of our time spent with him. He hardly ever puts locations on his photos and social media, and doesn't care much for ostentation. Crossing large swaths of open land, he doesn't always bother to capture the journey, as the road itself has become his life. On occasion he does record, but you can tell he travels for its own sake. As far as adventure riders go, he is a rare breed. Fabian is an old school, purist type of mover. Sometimes it drives me crazy to know where he is and the photos he posts. But once again, in true Fabian style, you'd have to ask the guy. One look at his clothing and you'll see the intersection of simplicity and practicality. Careless to trends, detached from major media conglomerate reach, absent from five star hotels, and illuminated by 1,000 starlit nights. Fabian told me about his experience watching American cable TV when his brother joined him for an American West motorcycle trip. Pretty cool, man. His reaction to the flickering light coming from the electric theater in their hotel room corner reminded me of my grandmother's summation of the domestic replacement to the radio. It's an idiot box, to put it euphemistically, and in her words. While spending our first days together, Fabian took a liking to my drone. He later bought the same model for himself after already being on the road for five years. What made of his first drone is a different story, one best heard from the source. We'll have to save that for tomorrow though. When we met at the campsite in Loreto, I assumed his bike was an antique on display. On occasion, people decorate their properties with such things as though it were a symbol to the romance of travel or something. 
This initial assumption of mine was only half inaccurate, of course. His machine was an antique all right, but not just for display, which in that way really made it more than a symbol. It made his bike a pumping, spinning testament to travel's romance. I had often thought of our motorbikes in this way, while dawdling about in romanticism. The machines are our horses made of iron, moltenly poured out of a smelter at birth. Our mounts chortle in wine with an industrial neigh, sending undulating echoes off canyon walls. I got to know Fabian and I shared a few good rides with the guy. At the moment he is back in Central America, heading back to Puerto Viejo, Costa Rica. The only place he had stayed put the longest thanks to the pandemic. Although we were never going the same direction, I'd go to the trouble to see him. And I'd do it again. He seemed to love seeing my country, and in the end, I loved seeing all the Mr. Anderson type of Americans with all their big RVs and questions, asking him all the same things we'd heard in Mexico, only now, in English. And, oh, you're kidding me. <laughs> Wow, good thing he's not married, huh? <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. No kids, no wife. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. What year is your Enfield? It's uh, 72. 72, very good. What what displacement? What's that? What size? Uh, 500 cc. 500. Very good. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Horsepower. I always like those. They had great lines to them. <laughs> nice looking bike. My brother, my brother used to uh, AJ, or AJ something like that. Wow. Was an old Safe AJ travels man. Car. Thank you. Man. They done hill climb with it. Oh, okay. AJ's, yeah. Uh, I have a Husqvarna. <laughs> I had a Triumph, I had a Triumph, and uh, I bent the forks on it. We straightened the forks out at work. I had big press. Took two pipes and cut them. <laughs> You to miss. The clouds blanket the sky, creating an incredible new depth and dimension, just as you are standing on a movie set. The entire place engulfed in what seems more like a painting than reality. It was Fabian's first choice on the map since our last ride together in La Paz. Oh! Next step's a doozy. Next step's a doozy. The Sheffield Trail? Schaffer. Schaffer. Okay, German. That's where we're going. All the way around. And that's where we're going to be. So this is what they call Schaefer Trail. Earlier, Fabian tried calling it Schaffer Trail or something like that. It's like he's some kind of psycholinguistic Latter-day Germanic colonizer in the state. Switchback is the magic word. That's where we're heading next. At whichever angle you looked, the same trail stared you back in the eye. The 4x4s eking their way up were more aberrations than actual people swallowed by his great canyon. Anyways, I decided to read this off the government site because I thought it was worth it. The Schaefer Trail winds 1,500 feet, that's 457 meters, down colorful sandstone walls. The Schaefer Trail at the island in the Sky District of Canyonlands National Park is an iconic road through a colorful, massive sandstone cliff. Its function has changed through the years, from a route made by Native Americans to access resources on the mesa top, to a trail for sheep herders moving flocks to better foraging in wintertime, and then a road for trucks moving loads of uranium from the back country to market. Today, the Schaefer Trail is a challenging, unpaved backcountry road for recreational users seeking the experience of a lifetime. Hoo-ah!
That little hoo part isn't on the website, by the way. Tested and true explorer pose, we stood there, staring out before us, somewhat out of breath. This is the West. I have often thought of the expression on my ancestors' faces if they'd have come to scene in the future, seeing what the country would later become. How would they view the emergent progress they'd helped build? Imagine having never seen some bi-wheeled mechanical horse roaring by somehow projecting itself forward on its own, carrying its rider over vast stretches within time spans so brief and over tracks so smooth, they'd likely catch the sun over the horizon if they please. Would they want to go for a ride? What do you think? Drown, 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 drown. But first, let's think of who these people actually were for a second. These are the people who would hold the reins of a horse in their teeth while taking aim and firing in full gallop at their enemy. Whether it be centralists, royalists, Spanish, Mexican, Redcoats, or Plains Indian. Frontier life often had alliances and coalitions formed between a variety of groups when their interests overlapped. The famed and lost battle site of Medina, down next to San Antonio, serving as one of them. These are the types of whom lands on the map are named. We choose to remember something about them, or we chose to. Or maybe even similar to a species unaware of its origin, led by instinct yet corrupted by its cage. Before the backdrop of industrialization, these are the people who raised the greatest body of engineers the world had seen since the days of the Roman Empire. These are the people who looked square at the natural world, as at many times it meant their very survival. What any biker would tell you, on some profoundly primal level, is just the same as what ancient thinkers such as Aristotle once considered. One must never underestimate what riding a horse does to a man's soul, because once he has sat in a saddle, no man will ever willingly wear a yoke. They looked at the great, empty North American plains, knew the uncertainty, brevity, and cruelties of life, then confronted it as though the threat were just a figment of the imagination as though it were never a threat from the start. They continued to look with yearning, even if some died or were born along the way. Many believed in their hearts it was providence. The thing expressed widely at the times was, make sure you're right, and then go ahead. In the vernacular of the day, these people were based AF. The issue of the entire matter being this. They simultaneously knew the alternative, a tenuous life of subjugation with the usual miserable yet familiar hells, preferred to farther, more distant, unfamiliar heavens. They chose uncertainty. They knew the alternative wasn't a life at all, but rather the empty spoils of cowardice, a province for those choosing the false veneer of security, today's false idol known as almighty safety. They bent the knee to no one, no king, no despot, no one. And they weren't afraid to have a fight over it either. They chose the unknown instead, even if it meant perishing at the hands of some dark unknown fate. They began the journey with the same look of reckless vigor found on the face of any determined, half-crazed soldier dug in for battle, scoffing at death there in the foxhole. That's the kind of people they were. The same spirit that projects Fabian's royal infield as it weaves through all the biomes of the planet is the very soul we find that has infused itself across the great expanses of the American West. That same American spirit lives on, actually. Writers like Alexis de Tocqueville noticed how vibrant this spirit is in contrast to its parent continent, Europe. American writer David Harzani wrote not long ago just how divergent the American spirit is from its progenitor to this day as though taking the American spirit's pulse or an inventory of character at the present end of a family diaspora. His polemic book found many things American Europhiles would be loath to say, 
one of which being the entrepreneurial reflex in the state remaining consistently durable over time, and what this has to say about our collective spirit even after generations of potential weakening under the wear of time, whereas Europe is quite the opposite. Arsanyi demonstrates EU citizens' propensity to seek government jobs over hedging one's own path. Something present in the states, sure, but not nearly as substantial as the disparity when it comes to entrepreneurialism in America. Oh, and by the way, I'm aware this whole time I've been calling the U.S. America. The implication and nuance are not lost to me. The corrective conversation meter has sounded before, and to that I bid my most timorous rebuttal to be expressed in true Western rhetoric. Not on this side of the Mississippi. Kit Carson once said, I don't know if I did right or wrong, but I always did my best. I understand not all people acted as saints by any means. It is easy to romanticize a lost time, failing to take stock of the golden age we may currently be experiencing in our post-World War II era still now. However, 1800s Americans did believe in something called self-determination, faith, and little r republicanism. They read literature denoting man's triumph over nature and Moby Dick, or ascribed to Thoreau's transcendental thoughts over nature and man's place in it while reading Life in the Woods. They were lovers of great adventure tales like The Count of Monte Cristo, drawn to its intrigue, redemption, and call to adventure. The name of the Wild West genre in its own time was called Blood and Thunder, and it was circulated in popular pulp fiction dime novel form. It was an exciting time to be alive, certainly. They had a social fabric in need of mending for some disenfranchised groups, no doubt, but one durable enough to form one shared nation state for liberty and justice for all. Nothing like the American experiment had ever happened in the world, and they knew it. Creaking forward on wagon wheels over a sea of rolling plains, the vanguard to the West's meteoric rise to greatness on the world stage was consecrated. Early Americans had meaning. They saw the private ownership of land as the geographic harbinger to self-determination. All those without the required composition of spit, grit, and fire in their bellies remained to the east of the Mississippi. Those who ventured out into the great unknown onto the frontier knew the price at times paid in order to mold one's own fate. It is their culture we have inherited. It is their DNA suffused west of the Mississippi, all the way to the Pacific, with their wooden spoke wagon wheels, various religious institutions, and freedom of the press. They form civic life in far-flung remote western lands, popping up humble little towns nowadays beyond recognition in scale and economy. Now major American cities presently hosting millions all stand tall without compunction toward the wild surrounding them, hardly conceivable as anything in what they once were pristine lands, the indwelling population may now be unable to recognize if transported back in time, seeing their home as it was before the first plow cracked soil. Statecraft shaped the West, and lest we forget, shapes us too. It's easy to overlook the difficulties endured of not long ago. It is also difficult to separate ourselves from our times and not fall prey to the temptation of judging others of far more distant times as though we stood back to back, heel to heel measuring our height to theirs, never bothering to turn around and actually look at them. The evils of their time were universal at that point in history, definitely a debit to the posterity of mankind overall. However, the credit to the West is exceptional, and not in the normative idea of exceptionalism, but rather the descriptive sense as it was something that simply didn't exist yet. In its creed, especially the tenets concerning natural law, liberty, individual rights, and popular sovereignty can be found the raw materials for self-correction. In accordance with its creed, a political framework unique to the West at that time, America is exceptional in the way she applies these universal principles sprung from the composition of classical philosophy, Christianity, and Enlightenment ideas. Awesome. <laughs> is it still recording? Do you see it on? Is it recording? Okay, good. I did the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. So where was I talking about 19th and 20th century Americans? 
This composition has now proved panacea in resolving past universal evils shared in the world. We are the cultural inheritors to these ideas unique to the West, in particular its brainchild and golden boy America. The one and only country in the world that derives its legitimacy from natural rights and natural law. That is, in short, American exceptionalism for you. All that said and done to bring us here, the beginnings of 2023. It is easy to forget it wasn't long ago before life got so soft for us here in the States. Before Amazon, before power steering, before air conditioning, before infant mortality rates came down so much, before all that. We are to those of the Wild West an approximate equal measure similar in distance between them and the Enlightenment thinkers whose ideas would be put to use so fervently in their time in the United States. We must not go back too many generations before our ancestors were crossing massive geographic spans with families in tow. Sometimes people were forced, other times simply trudging forward one step at a time with little else other than a smidgen of hope. These people certainly experienced fear in their lives, their cost-benefit analysis, views on life and death, risk-taking, all that meld together to form a distinctive line of demarcation separating our worldview from theirs. Well, I say I'm definitely a satisfied customer coming out here to Moab. Doing it right, riding around here in Moab on this Harley, I tell you what, for my man Fabian coming out here. I done told you once, I done told you a thousand times. You come out to Moab, you gonna have a good time. I don't know if you remember seeing this, but at the one-stop shop grocery store, we had bought Fabian's idea of lunch. Bread, cheese, and onion sandwiches. <laughs> at this point, Fabian fed me this dinner. Never found out if this kind of sandwich was a Swiss thing or a Fabian thing. Oh, well, I guess it didn't matter much. You can call me anything you want, just not late for dinner. Daylight was running out, and you know what time it is. Oh, you know what time it is. Time to shoot with the GoPro 10. Yeah. Straight from Fabian. Epic. <laughs> now that I got that all out there, time for us to put together one of our very own super amazing Travis and Fabian Canyonlands flyovers. much. We needed to get to the camp before nightfall. Now let's get back to this wind therapy. So we turned around and gone back up all those switchbacks. I'll save you the footage. You already saw it coming down. As I was saying, most thoughts while on a bike seem to just go away on their own. It really is where clarity of mind may be found, sometimes ushering in itinerant thoughts unrelated to one another, other times demanding my undivided attention such that every freewheeling thought on the loose now properly silenced and concentrated on a single point and may now be properly cast away with all the other objects into the blurred periphery. All thoughts while on a good ride are transmuted. All those nagging tasks on the agenda, the unfinished business meetings, all those inclinations to either orchestrate some imagined event or prevent it from transpiring, 
All thought that isn't directly linked to keeping the machine straddled between my legs and upright, therefore keeping my soul still intact with my body. All those thoughts, all those things, are now in a holding cell, languishing in the dark, not to be released. In these moments, I'm free. Even those who came out of 19 hard times, those still with pulsating circulatory systems, that is, those who are the cultural keepers of these times within living memory, even now they continue to offer a glimpse, oftentimes told in shortened breath, sure, but it is those who live, still, standing in the gap, intentionally or not, speaking of former status quos and zeitgeist to an increasingly broadening chasm of what once was to what now is. Perhaps it is ineffable, entirely impossible to put into words, save nothing short of actually being some eternal being watching the cosmic theater performance unfold. Going back just to the 19th century now, and observing my own reaction to it, I found it seemingly an innate, gut-level reflex to see these people and pity them for all the deprivation they lived with throughout their entire existence. Seldom do I consider the inverse, though. If they would have had a people into our times, what would they have pitied in us? Surely the technology of the day would have them dazzled, at least for a few days. Online dating sites, credit cards, fast food, and pharmaceutical commercials ad nauseum would have left certain bereft feeling within. Having once had some infinite thing now to their descendants, no more than a message in a bottle of float on a vast ocean surface further rendered more obscure in an age characterized by messages traveling via airwave instead, never on parchment, seldom with ink and paper, and disappearingly in cursive, no less. Whatever it is they may have pitied in us, their reaction would have been far from long-winded. I think they'd have kept it short and sweet, as were the elocutionists in their chosen rhetoric of the time. They would have most likely smiled and told us the simple aphorism they'd have once had told to them. Man cannot live on bread alone. One of the ironies while living through the tech revolution is hard to see, the unexpected part being this. Generational pity isn't a one-way street. Let's do some wild camping with Fabian. It was like we were back in Baja, only now in the US of America. Popped my tent and then got ready with this inflatable green thing I thought was worth carrying along for the ride. I haven't used this since I was driving trucks in the Midwest. I do this. It's like you get them, it's like you gotta have them both open. <laughs> a good gust of wind and then running it. But you see, you wanna get both in there. No. Go, 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 go. <laughs> Maybe so, I may actually do it. One more. More.
And do you sleep on this one? You probably could. Yeah. The thing is with these, you got to make sure like... Yeah, everything in here. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> maybe, maybe here, over, over here. Yeah, yeah. It still works. <laughs> it's been like five years. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe that sounds like little holes poking. <laughs> Drilling Fabian with my chin. <laughs> Boom. That's the life. I'm ready to watch the rain come in. Wait, rewind. Looks like we got some rain coming in, possibly. Maybe it'll go the other way. Hold on, here's somebody coming. Oh yeah, and Fabian built a fire. All right, I made it to Moab successfully. I didn't die on the way, thank God. I am reacquainted with Fabian and it looks like he actually got the fire going. I really wanna make a s'more for him, but I didn't know that he had never tried one nor knew what it was. Sun's going down, well it is down. It seemed like it was gonna rain. It's a pretty still night. We're out here on the public camping grounds, gratis, and I thought I couldn't get that fire going. I left to look for maybe some trash, paper, or cardboard. There's none to be found, so that's kind of good, really. I'm coming back, and I can tell our campsite by the flame I see through the trees. So Fabian was clearly successful. He's trying to use the tumbleweeds to get it going. He's the freaking man. He also lives like this, so maybe I could take some notes from him. Let's go back to before Fabian made the campsite cozy. Why don't you check out our setup for the night? Fabian's got us all set up. Freaking his whole battery system. Got the laptop working. Got pretty much everything a guy could ask for. His entire life on wheels. And we're gonna see if we get rained on or not. Earlier I had mentioned something about Fabian. Like I said, he'd loan you anything you needed. Even total strangers. Once after we had made camp, and Fabian made the place all cozy, turns out a guy couldn't find his car, and had backtracked, riding frantically on his bicycle. I heard the spokes coming up to me at the fire, just when I couldn't see much beyond its blinding light at that nearness. He needed help now that it was getting dark, and couldn't find his vehicle. So Fabian lent him a flashlight, one of those you put on your head. He was frantically searching until about midnight, and I think he found his vehicle, but later came back, thanked us, and left the light hanging from my bike's handlebars. Only, he kept the strobe on by accident, maybe not meaning to, just couldn't seem to turn it off right. Anyway, it wasn't a huge deal, it was just kind of distressing as I was just about to finally fall asleep, and now only one thing didn't add up. I didn't hear any vehicle roll away. We were out in a wide open area. I would have certainly heard his vehicle drive away. I mean, why would he find his vehicle and then walk back in the dark, not being able to find it again? Things didn't add up. We were in the middle of nowhere, just the two of us, and I was on edge. Very little sleep. It was never meant to be a restful trip anyway. After all, nobody was going to stop us from having our Travis and Fabian super amazing adventure time. Sticking with the theme of reading off of government websites, let's have a go at it again. A Red Rock Wonderland. Discover a landscape of contrasting colors, landforms, and textures unlike any other. The park has over 2,000 natural stone arches, hundreds of soaring pinnacles, massive rock fins, and giant balanced rocks. 
This red rock wonderland will amaze you with its formations, refresh you with its trails, and inspire you with its sunsets. That's the description of the Arches National Park, and that's where we were going once the sun came up. Sleep often being a casualty for those with a lust for life, of course. Well, Fabian slept well. I thought he'd been stabbed to death, honestly. The way that guy left Fabian's headlamp on the Harley's handlebar with the strobe fully engaged pointed directly at my head, then no sound from his vehicle as it rolled away, not even the go-kart sounding electric whir of a hybrid catching its first gears. I would have heard wheels rolling over the country road. Something disconcerting lives on the edge separating day from night. Once again, in the vernacular of our day, crazy man, crazy. From here on, it's all tarmac. of all the moto vlogs I've made yet. I mean, I'm pushing full-on documentary link. So meta, so introspective, so modest. section is considered by some to be the beating heart of Arches National Park. Oh, you know what time it is. Super amazing adventure time with Bobby and Travis. And yeah, I'm not, I haven't lost anything. I feel like I'm losing things sometimes. Definitely sleep. But we are here. The Arches way. The area contains a large concentration of arches and is one of the most scenic locations in the park. North Window, Turret Arch, and Double Arch are just a few of the awe-inspiring expanses you'll find in just over two square miles. I want to go soon to go get it. Other named features in this area include Garden of Eden, Elephant Butte, and Parade of Elephants. We bounced past Balanced Rock and went to the windows section. At least under one of the arches, we'd catch some cover from the passing showers. Okay, it looks like we may be staying under the arches. Fabian just told me we may have to do that. It looks like it's gonna rain. Oh yeah. These goggles are making my eyes grow apart, <laughs> By the time we walked up Turret Arch, the rain arrived. Meanwhile, Fabian can catch us up on his nearly being murdered by some drunk member of the Sinaloa cartel while wild camping in Mexico. Wet, dry, wet, dry, wet, and dry again. Had to wait the rain out here in Utah. Okay, well, here we go. What happened to you in Sinaloa while we're here waiting out the rain? Um, I plan to to go to Copper Canyon. You know Copper Canyon? Yeah, I know it. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I was, I took the ferry to Mazatlan and I actually I planned to, to go around Sinaloa, but I ended up to go across because it was too far. It was about 800 kilometers to go around or something. 
and at uh, one point I, just, I decided just to go across the, to cross the mountains mm -hmm. and uh, yeah I, uh, it was late afternoon and um, I, I decided to camp somewhere just in the middle of nowhere it was a mistake and about eight, Eight o'clock, nine o'clock at night, some guy with on a motorcycle came, and he he spotted me, and he left, and I thought, yeah, okay, and just uh, I slept, and about I don't know two hours later, uh, a big car uh, came, three guys with guns, yeah and um, yeah. yeah pointed and, at you yes and they asked me what i'm doing here and they searched everything and they saw my cameras and my drone and it was not good did they say <laughs> anything else yeah the one guy he was drunken and uh he he was angry he was fucking angry and uh yeah he took my computer my drone everything he wanted to to see there? what I was filming, and yeah. I'm glad you're alive. Yes. Yeah. And then uh, I thought they they take me with. In one point, he said I should grab my stuff. I put I put everything on the bike and. Then I realized they they let me go. Oh, so oh I, I could just, just got your stuff and yeah, left. And I just took off. In the middle of the middle, night. Middle of the night. Right. And I drove back to yeah, Mazatlan. <laughs> it, it was freezing cold and. Uh, How long of a ride back? Uh, it was about two and a half hours. Fabian, for one, is lucky to still have his body and soul fully intact. <laughs> <laughs> The Double Arch Trail is considered barrier-free. The trail has a hard-packed surface. There are some slopes and a sandy surface at the end of the trail. Accessible parking is available. You know what, I've seen this in some of our textbooks and stuff. Never actually been here. Let's kick it off with a montage. Anytime you may find yourself beginning to watch a movie and then notice a black and white film in the first few frames instead, it is either one of two things. A classic film from another time, or some craptastically pretentious artsy-fartsy flick written by Lost Souls about Lost Souls, creating somewhat of a synergistic infinite regress of self-congratulatory lost men. 
The traditional heroic male lead I grew up with was scrapped somewhere between my adolescence and now, as it didn't exactly fit Hollywood's political priors at the time of the shift. Stoic, strong, virtuous men in film are absent now, and the legacies of many, those whom at least the viewer could retreat to the comfort of in past productions, now remain reworked or reimagined, to use one of their words, appearing in unnecessary and poorly written sequels where the current spectacle delivers on the special effects, yet repossesses and deconstructs the traditional masculine hero, Luke Skywalker being one of the scalps hung out to tan as of late. So why bring this up in the middle of my interminable Motovlog Utah episode? Well, it actually has to do with what I mentioned when we were driving down all those switchbacks. The voices of the past, our ancestry, all those who worked, suffered, loved, and lost, all those now with their last grains of sand in the hourglass, fully spent, all seem to speak loudly and in unison on this topic. Just another simple thought, clear to them, but opaque and lost to us now. The thought being this, children are not wise. That's all. No need to intellectualize that. Doing away with the old, tested and true, listening to kids, has become a defining characteristic of our time. Like any good lie, the deceit is only useful when shrouded in a half-truth. Truth, from the mouths of babes, is a notion put forth in scripture when children begin to worship Jesus as the Messiah after seeing him restore the sight of two blind men. It really pissed off the religious leaders of the time. This very same notion seems to have been not only corrupted from its appearance in Matthew, but in its modern understanding as well, much to our duress. Made into a movie, evidently, too. Come On, Come On is a Mike Mills movie starring the intrepid weirdo Joaquin Phoenix as Uncle Johnny, a disheveled and emotionally untucked journalist who goes around the country interviewing children about the future and their feelings about it. Seems benign at worst till you begin to hear all the pop absurdities of the day, further made caricature-like given the topics at hand and the interviewees at the microphone. Climate change, animal extinction, and loneliness. They cover the gambit. Why? Because children are a repository of virtue and enlightenment thinkers. That's why. Joaquin Phoenix's character and probably the actor himself are made of the same substance writers of a hundred years ago warned us. These are the men without chests, as C.S. Lewis once wrote about in The Abolition of Man. In his words, Phoenix's character, and honestly, the actor himself, once again, are both irredeemable urban blockheads. In the modern world, according to Lewis, over 80 years ago, we have trained the head and encouraged the heart while neglecting the soul. Or, as Lewis so scathingly put it, we are producing men without chests. In a sort of ghastly simplicity, we remove the organ and demand the function. We make men without chests and expect of them virtue and enterprise. We laugh at honor and are shocked to find traitors in our midst. We castrate and bid the geldings be fruitful. Lewis wrote, The true teacher seeks to impart knowledge and wisdom, to teach truth and to leaven the human being. Not to conform him to the standards of the ephemeral, the fleeting, and the passing. For every one pupil who needs to be guarded from a weak excess of sensibility, there are three who need to be awakened from the slumber of cold vulgarity. The task of the modern educator is not to cut down jungles, but to irrigate deserts. The right defense against false sentiments is to inculcate just sentiments. By starving the sensibility of our pupils, we only make them easier prey to the propagandist when he comes. For famished nature will be avenged, and a hard heart is no infallible protection against a soft head. Following in the line of not only Plato and St. Augustine, but also of Hinduism, Buddhism, and Confucianism, teachers and professors must align themselves and their students with the eternal verities and the natural laws, recognizing that we do know real things, true things and false things. In the chapter, Lewis finishes by arguing that one can know what is true, good, and beautiful through the intellect, the head, the imagination, the chest or soul, and the passions, the heart, and the stomach. Of these, Lewis argues in traditional Western fashion, the most important is the chest or the soul, the aristocratic part of the person, the part that serves as a bridge between the analytical and the passionate, between the machine-like aspect and the animal-like aspect of man. Strangely and paradoxically, it is the soul as a mirror, that is, the faculty which reflects the divine. That's what makes man most man. 
even though it is the least human aspect about it. We are in essence spiritual beings having a human experience, not trying to achieve the reverse while sitting in some holy place. Even the agnostics and atheists are drawn to beautiful places by instinct, a latent spiritual draw to seek such a thing, like a vestigial organ that is better not removed yet, or ever. Lewis begins the abolition of man with this chapter, Men Without Chests. At that time, he was analyzing a newly published work geared toward teaching English to secondary school students. Lewis laments that the two authors are far more interested in teaching their own poor and poorly formed ethics than they are in teaching English, their own subject. A student who studies this textbook carefully will learn nothing of grammar, style, or definition but we'll learn a great deal about the personal social views of the two authors. Rather than educating, the two authors, wittingly or not, are conditioning. The boy who thinks he is doing his English prep and has no notion that ethics, theology, and politics are all at stake, it is not a theory they put into his mind, but an assumption, which ten years hence, its origin forgotten and its presence unconscious, will condition him to take one side in a controversy which he has never recognized as a controversy at all. The authors themselves, I suspect, hardly know what they are doing to that boy, and he cannot know what is being done to him. The abolition of man has served as one of the finest non-reactionary bulwarks against the faddish ideologies and various subjectivisms and other nihilistic nonsense. Pumped out to us off the media assembly line. Things that lend hand to this willful misuse of educational authority. Knowledge is the truth, and the truth shall set you free. But not until it's done with you. <laughs> Well, it's a sunny day, and then it's a rainy day, and then a sunny day again. But we're having one heck of a time. We're out here at the very end. Is this the end? Nope. Of the road? Okay, not at the very end of the Arches National Park route. And it's mighty fine. Satisfied American. Exactly. <laughs> we are one. Yo, we got rainbows on rainbows on rainbows though around here, man. I tell you what. All right, check it out. Let me flip it. Yeah. 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 The fluidity of time marks us with similar trends experienced throughout the ages. It wasn't a given we would come to see the world in this way. Our worldview was shaped by many over a long course of time, events, and geography, especially when considering Athens and Jerusalem. Our Western worldview was an inherited gift granted us in the U.S. certainly. We are from an exceptional tradition, and being told otherwise is a lie, one insidious enough to actually make the believer, in time, hold life in contempt. Most of America's enemies know they can't take down the big dog, so instead they attempt to give him fleas and watch him chew himself apart. American decadence has a shelf life, but also a few funny faces. 
In the past, people in the U.S. lived day to day on much less. The institution of fat men societies were found sprouting up across the nation as a means of showcasing personal prosperity. In a sense, the bar for this look of prosperity has been lowered to the common income earner. But that kind of prosperity, now the trick to living in modern America, is not dying by some personal avarice or indulgence. Whereas before you may succumb to some Oregon Trail type of death, now it is under the weight of their success, pun intended, that we find our survival stories. Everything is a problem of excess over privation in the U.S. We are all born into a world at a time and a place outside of our control. Our ancestors understood sacrifice for the deferred gratification of family. I'm not saying this in the imperative. What I'm saying is we are the deferred gratification delivered. The irony is most don't even know it. As usual with free will, the inheritors of the deferred gratification now in full bloom choose whether to squander the sacrifice or not. They even get to decide how the sacrifice of many lifetimes is justified. The actual anti-human humanists of Davos and their Henry Kissinger-esque take on control. You know, the whole you'll own nothing and be happy, depopulate the earth crew. Yeah, those guys. The corrupted paternal sociopaths are still sending out trial balloons to the west from their luxurious ski resort of a town, located smack dab on the sick old man continent of the world known as Europe, a place of true faded glory now, having seen its best geopolitical times a bit farther away in the rear view, an echo resounding of progress, yet all too resonant of one of their very own antiquated aphorisms. That being, don't trust Greeks bearing gifts. The rise and fall of civilizations is nothing new, of course. Anacyclosis. Regime change. The ancient Greeks considered it, and that's what they called it. We are aware of the concept, but in practice, we act something different. We act as though there were no ebb and flow to history at all, somewhat of an amnesia to the collective, almost as if it were on a rail, unable to deviate without destruction. Although exceptional in our founding, binding forces of nature make no exception regarding our civilization's trajectory, its decay included. Our homegrown cabal of unelected bureaucrats acting as an invisible hand seems somewhat of a historical rhyme given the Praetorian Guard of Imperial Rome once did the same. Seat to power a weak leader as a decoy to avert public attention away from those who actually hold the reins of power. All short-sighted contributors to the decay of their civilization. A lot like sawing off the branch you're sitting on. The Davos class of people seem to be categorized as agents of civilizational decay too. All with the best of social engineering intentions, of course. Going back to early American settlements, it wasn't certain the first American settlers would not end up getting demapped by the Indians had they organized themselves to amass enough of a military force to neuter the westward expansion taking place. John Wesley Wolf, a Civil War veteran, left his family in Ohio to find relief from his wounds in a drier climate. He and his oldest son established a cattle ranch and trading stop for Indians. In their last years on the ranch, John's daughter Flora and her family kept him company and contributed to the ranch. John Wesley Wolf was born on February 17, 1829 in Tennessee. When the Civil War broke out in 1861, John joined the Union even though his home state joined the Confederacy. He fought in several major battles as a member of the 17th Ohio Battery. At the Siege of Vicksburg, John injured his leg lifting a cannon out of the mire and was given a disability discharge. He never walked without the aid of a crutch again, and this injury eventually prompted him to move to Utah. In 1898, at the age of 69, John decided to heed his doctor's advice and move to a drier climate. He hoped the desert air would alleviate the pain in his leg and stop the infection from spreading. He only managed to convince his son Fred to go with him to southern Utah. John's wife and their three other children stayed behind in Ohio. John and Fred erected a simple cabin and set to work creating their Bar DX ranch. Though it's not visible today, there was abundant native grass in the area that allowed over 1,000 cattle to graze in the Wolf's Ranch. In 1906, John's daughter Flora and her family came to live on the ranch. She and her husband Ed Stanley and their children Esther and Farrell brought new life to the remote homestead. 
Fred and Ed built a new cabin with wood floors and a window to make Flora and the children more comfortable. The men hauled timber from the Colorado River to use for the walls. They built the roof of a frame of small logs and a large center beam. Fred and Ed laid bark from juniper trees and dirt from the surrounding hills over the top of the frame. The children helped stuff clay into the cracks between logs for insulation. This cabin is visible from the trailhead. Despite living in such a remote area, the Wolfs and Stanleys ate well. John irrigated a garden by plugging the creek that ran nearby with a simple dirt dam. He grew squash, corn, pumpkins, and a few extra melons to trade with the Indians who passed through. Few things made John angry as when a rainstorm flushed out the dam. The family ate rabbit, venison, and chicken until butchering season came each fall and they had fresh beef. John supplanted their diet with groceries like canned milk that he picked up at Thompson Springs. Ed missed fresh milk so much that he once tried to milk a wild cow. The rest of the family watched as the cow kicked both hind feet, and Ed quickly learned to be content with canned milk. After two years, the Stanleys moved to Moab so their children could receive a formal education. In 1910, John sold the ranch to Tommy Larson and moved back to Ohio. John died in October of 1913 at the age of 84. In 1914, Marvin Turnbow, the first custodian of Arches National Monument, bought the ranch from Larson. His family used the cabin occasionally until they sold it to Emmett Elizondo, who eventually sold the property to the U.S. government for inclusion in Arches National Monument. People come from all over the world to visit the Arches National Park. When visiting delicate arches on the top of many visitors' to-do list. In a park with over 2,000 stone arches, this particular freestanding arch has become a widely recognized symbol of the state of Utah and one of the most famous geological features in the world. The trail to see Delicate Arch up close and personal is three miles round trip and climbs 480 feet, that's 146 meters. Along this steady uphill trail, you'll also pass the Wolf Ranch cabin and a wall of Ute Indian petroglyphs. getting hot in here. The light opening beneath the arch is 46 feet high and 32 feet wide, making it the largest freestanding arch in the park. It has had more than a few names in its history, from the colorful Cowboys Chaps, Old Maids Bloomers, to the prosaic Salt Wash Arch. The term delicate first appeared in a January 1934 article about the Arches National Monument Scientific Expedition, which described it as the most delicately chiseled arch in the entire area. It's like somebody cleaned it. It is. Like a Zamboni passed over this. The Zamboni. And the second time I was faster, I arrived like four o'clock a little bit. Join Fabia.
conquest was not a new phenomenon in the Americas. It certainly predated European involvement. The difference present in our history is that the conquest was carried out by a people who worshipped a deity, once a man, a man who suffered and died a slave's death on a cross, then rose after three days, of course. To say this distinction doesn't make a difference is to miss the mark entirely. Our Western values and beliefs are umbilically connected to Christianity. Much like the two young fish puzzled at the greeting of the wise old fish inquiring of the state of the water for the day, having not ever considered what water even is. We are the same. We are swimming in it, totally saturated in its assumptions, but, at the very same time, amnesiac enough to not even notice we are wet, or to even recall getting into the water at all. In Tom Holland's book Dominion, he illustrates just how the Christian revolution shaped our views in the West. So vast had the scope of Roman power become that any man who succeeded in making himself its master was liable to seem less human than divine. Divinity, then, was for the very greatest of the great, for victors, heroes, and kings. Its measure was the power to torture one's enemies, not to suffer it oneself, to nail them to the rocks of a mountain, or to turn them into spiders, or to blind and crucify them after conquering the world. That a man who had himself been crucified might be hailed as a god could not help but be seen by people everywhere across the Roman world as scandalous, obscene, and grotesque. The ultimate offensiveness, though, was to one particular people, Jesus' own. Holland demonstrates just how revolutionary this was in a world very foreign to contemporary sensibilities today. The will of God still finds its way, although, while beset by human defect, oftentimes, even choosing to use our loneliness, our human frailty, as the vehicle to achieving his ends. God can write straight with crooked lines. All human frailty can ultimately find redemption and emerge from the broken, now made beautiful. Just as the unification of the Roman Empire encapsulated the Mediterranean, the ancient military powerhouse provided at its time a globalized world, and, although it spread its hegemony at the point of a sword, from it was laid the path for a people passing from a polytheistic tradition to a more centralized age. One empire, one god. The success of the Christian revolution is so total, it has evolved over time to the point of its more dubious counterfeits seeming, at times, to be something other than the empty husks that they are. From this Christian revolution comes many blessings. What has shaped the modern world is at its heart cut from the same cloth. Have a look at the scientific revolution as well as the American university system. This wasn't something that just occurred in a vacuum. Christianity's role is so present it is difficult to see at times. What isn't difficult to see is our current godless faith known as secular humanism. The scientific revolution created its own new faith in secular humanism so persuasive it has severed itself completely from its parent, making itself a popular currency in the here and now. It is nothing more than an outgrowth, which, like many other beliefs held in the West, has found its seedbed in Christianity. The moment that counterfeits undergo any real scrutiny, it becomes very clear they cannot stand on their own. This doesn't mean they aren't still clever enough to deceive. The best feature of the phony currency being its useful ability to market itself as good. We drop bombs with all-inclusive colorful flags tailing one another to ground zero, our homes then turn and declare the self-inflicted destruction as virtuous. It really is the best two birds with one stone situation for the ruling class in particular, offering not only a belief system, but also cover as counterfeit virtue, dressing itself as a substitute for a quietly inherited and tenuously understood Christian assumptions. We are filled with a vague sense of righteous morality having hit near the target, close enough to seem sensible to those raised in the Western tradition, but still not quite there. One must simply take inventory of the spirit to see. Does it satisfy on a personal level? Does it serve the better interest of maintaining a durable social fabric? All these questions seem often dismissed or not considered at all. However, one fact remains unchallenged, and it's not so vague or tenuous. These secular humanists still haven't formed a coherent value system based on reason alone. It is their best kept secret hiding out in the open. The enemy of the best is not the worst, but rather the good. This, so to speak, good morality has begun rearing its head enough for us to see just how insufficient a substitute it really is. Holland writes, 
If secular humanism derives not from reason or from science, but from the distinctive course of Christianity's evolution, a course that, in the opinion of growing numbers in Europe and America, has left God dead, then how are its values anything more than the shadow of a corpse? What are the foundations of its morality, if not a myth? A myth, though, is not a lie. It is most profound as Tolkien, that devout Catholic, always argued. A myth can be true. To be a Christian is to believe that God came down as man and suffered a death as terrible as any mortal has ever suffered. This is why the cross, that ancient implement of torture, remains what it has always been, the fitting symbol of the Christian revolution. It is the audacity of it, the audacity of finding in it a twisted and defeated corpse, the glory of the creator of the universe. That serves to explain, more surely than anything else, the sheer strangeness of Christianity and of the civilization to which it gave birth. Today, the power of this strangeness remains as alive as it has ever been. It is manifest in the great surge of conversions that has swept Africa and Asia over the past century, in the conviction of millions upon millions that the breath of the Spirit, like a living fire, still blows upon the world, and in Europe and North America, in the assumptions of many more millions who would never think to describe themselves as Christian, all are heirs to the same revolution, a revolution that has, at its molten heart, the image of a god dead on a cross. In the beginning of making this moto vlog, I set out to eventually get big enough to be cancelled. I failed. My cancellation cancelled itself. In true authentic self-expression, it flipped the switch, imploded, and then concluded its very own self-erasure. Just like the West, its florid exceptionalism also bears the seeds of its very own destruction. As for me, just some guy making a YouTube video. Maybe that's a bit of a stretch. The West is a good thing to have happened. There's no such thing as an unalloyed good in the world. The philosophical ideas currently behind the culture war in America, and if I'm really honest, truly what has spurred me to make the video in this way, are these. One. Natural law is a myth. There are no fixed truths. 2. Rights are not fixed by natural law, but invented and change over time. Defined as seeking ever new forms of individual self-expression, based on appetites, desires, and preferences. 3. History is progressive, always marching towards some undefined goal of ever greater personal liberation. And finally, 4. Individual freedom is a radical undertaking, completely devoid of personal responsibility, and the founding notion of virtue, and always focused on personal pleasures, needs, desires, and experiences. Atheistic philosophers like Frederick Nietzsche and Marxists like Herbert Marcuse were widely influential in the American Academy for the past 60 years, far more so than Thomas Locke. And it's from their influence that we can see the strange striving of the left for personal liberation as a goal of the social collective. The radical individualism and libertinism of today is derived not from the founding, but from cultural Marxism and the radical individualism of identity politics. Our American identity, American exceptionalism, is intrinsically bound to our founding principles. Anti-American activist academics like Howard Zinn have been hacking at the trunk of our founding, with the familiar charge that America is irredeemably tainted by racism and that our founding fathers were slave-owning hypocrites. Our written constitution is outdated and needs to be living, which means its text and original intent cannot be ignored, but intentionally overthrown. Natural rights have been replaced by the group rights of gender and other identity groups. All right, so let's have one last ride before saying farewell.
justice is on the ropes too, at least in respects to it being applied to the non-ruling class, justice has begun to take on an insidiously modifying word just before it. Some verdicts, cherry-picked by the legacy media and broadcasted to the hapless masses, seem to favor group justice lately. Marching to the tune of supposed victimhood, the advocates for social justice scoff at the founding principles, the very principles protecting them individually from the predations of centralized government, but, according to them, don't serve their broader group agenda, something the neoliberals would have us believe doesn't trample the rights of other individuals. Willful blindness is the only explanation to account for this coordinated assault on our founding document. Justice buckles at the knees under the threat of mob rule. Individual justice is the only legitimate modifier before the noun to keep justice itself just. Ayn Rand once wrote, the smallest minority on earth is the individual. Those who deny individual rights cannot claim to be defenders of minorities. This is the acknowledgement of the sovereignty of the individual, and that government is in service of the individual and not the individual to the government. This, however, in the context of the call for minority rights today, is not what or how the left defines their great demand for minority rights and equality. Theirs is the call for socially constructed minorities as defined by identity politics to not only be defined by government, but controlled by and directed to the service of the state for the purpose of the state, absent the individual. America didn't experience her meteoric rise to the top from the perverse ideas of neoliberalism. This idea of government is beholden to the people, that it has no source of power except the sovereign people, is still the newest and most unique idea in all the long history of man's relation to man. The idea has no historical gauge. Nowhere in history has the common man experienced such prosperity on a scale so massive for such a prolonged amount of time. This is a fact. The United States Constitution is the world's longest surviving written charter of government. Only the United Kingdom, America's progenitor, may be older, but it comes short in that it isn't codified. Once again, we are from an exceptional tradition. Our Constitution, written in 1787, ratified in 1788, and in operation since 1789, in its first three words, we the people, affirm that the government of the United States exists to serve its citizens. The supremacy of the people, through their elected representatives, is recognized in Article I which creates a Congress consisting of a Senate and a House of Representatives. The positioning of Congress at the beginning of the Constitution affirms its status as the first branch of the federal government. The Constitution's entire internal locus of control is centered on the individual. We are responsible for our own success. I am the future. I am the future of this great nation. I love you guys. Don't get me wrong, it's all about this. But for the first time in my life, I'm 18 and I can say, fuck. The long-winded chapter of super amazing Travis and Fabian Adventure Time has come to a close. At least for now, I headed to Salt Lake City. Utah, nowhere. I turned northwest and rode to catch the sun, at least a price anyway. Check it out, heading back with my bug eyes. And we are in beautiful Utah still, about to be headed home. That was worth it. I haven't mentioned this on here yet as I've veered off editing the 2021 moto vlog quite a bit. It's not been two years since we have left and I am here editing the trip to see Fabian in Utah. To know why it has taken me so long would require knowing, at least to some extent, how the trip ended. We made it to South America. For that time and place, we were very fortunate to have made it so far considering international travel at that time. This isn't what I wanted to record though, and I don't know that it's something I ever wanted to record honestly, but here it is. By the time we arrived in Medellin, my wife Sam was diagnosed with breast cancer. We've been fighting it now for a year. We are still in the middle of the fight. She's the most courageous woman I know. My boy Jan actually mentioned it in his moto vlog a while ago. He actually gets things done in a much faster, more efficient way than I do when it comes to editing, of course. Only Sam can really tell her story the best. As her husband, I only speak for myself. The early days took me a bit to get the right attitude toward the C word, if we're to be put in a hyper-sanitized way. It's incredible how quickly the human mind can adapt to something over a short amount of time, and then sometimes still recoiling in fear as though back at square one. These momentary relapses coming and going in moments fewer and farther between over the course of time, thankfully, 
What I've come to learn over this amount of time serving my wife, watching her her level of self-discipline. A limited resource for people like me, by the way. Anyway, seeing her go through the ringer on this fight, all that, it's come with its insights. One of which being this. Life is a very delicate, beautifully tragic, and blindingly brief little incarnate affair. Not only that, but it must be held as sacred, as it is precious. It is worth fighting for, and all the passing moments I'd strolled on by and took for granted for so long. All those moments now demand I remove my shoes as I enter into their holiness. Maybe it is the human condition. I could not have held these moments with her in my heart as I do with her without the grim C word having entered our marriage. We really are living one day at a time, and we have had so much occur for which we are very grateful. God's fingerprints are all over the place. True spirituality in its more useful form is seeing even the bad times can still be fundamentally good. Sam has taught me this. God speaking through her often. She is my Ezra Penegdo, my lifesaver. Well, came on down to Utah, rented a Harley. Anyway, I've not seen this state nearly as much as I have just now, and I very much have desires to come back with my beautiful and beloved Samantha Marie next time around. Thanks for joining me. It's been good, been good.